Ladies and gentlemen, it is our privilege to present to you the criminally sane. This harrowing tale was presented to and scripted by The Gathering. We leave it for you to decide fact or fiction. <laughs> writing my story from my hospital bed. Not that I'm injured, so much as traumatized, but nevertheless the hospital wanted me in to check me over and ensure I was seen by a counselor. In turn, the counselor was so horrified by my story that she has recommended I speak with a psychiatrist. So here I am, sitting on top of my hospital bed awaiting the arrival of a psychiatrist and i must admit i am not too happy about having to see one you see he's on his way over from the hospital for the criminally insane everyone in these parts knows of the hospital for the criminally insane as children we always refer to it as the loony bin but political correctness and mental health education has taught us not to be so harsh in our judgment when the counselor was here he suggested as part of my cure package that I write down what I had just experienced. Apparently writing things down helps us to process such traumas. So here I am writing my story. I don't actually know where to start with my story, but as most people say, start at the beginning. I think I will do just that and start at the very beginning, the day I was born. I was born on a very special day St. Valentine's Day, February 14, 1960. As a result of my birth falling on such a romantic day, my parents christened me Valentina. I loved my name and I insisted I was called Valentina. Some people enjoyed abbreviating my name, but I didn't like it. I was abbreviated to Val or Tina, both of which I hated. Aside of that, when people abbreviated my name to Val, it was assumed my name was Valerie, and as a child, I would get very distressed at being called Valerie, and would often throw quite an impressive tantrum if some stupid adult offended me by using a horrid name. No offense to Valerie's anywhere, but the name is nowhere near as pretty as my name, Valentina. My tantrums would often have my parents laughing, so I must admit to rather enjoying the excuse to throw a tantrum. Anyway, I digress. I had the most fabulous childhood. I was an only child, but I didn't feel like an only child because my parents lived on a farm. They were farmhands and we had a beautiful cottage on that farm right next door to the big farmhouse. My parents had worked for Mr. James Clark and Mrs. Margaret Clark, but I always knew them as Mr. and Mrs. C. Not that they insisted upon the formality, far from it, but I was so used to hearing all their staff refer to them as Mr. and Mrs. C that for me, the name stuck. Mr. and Mrs. C had two children, Mark, who was three years older than me, and Julie, who was the same age as me. It was because of Mark and Julie that I never felt like an only child, for we grew up together. Memories of my early childhood bring me nothing but joy, primarily of my loving parents, the kindness bestowed upon me by Mr. and Mrs. C. And not to mention the other farmhands spoiling me with sweets, toys, and compliments on what a pretty little girl I was. Then, of course, memories of life on the farm, the freedom, running through the fields, jumping streams, swimming and boating in the river, riding those ponies, and camping in our tents with no parents, all done with my playmates, Mark and Julie. At least everything was perfect until Mark started big school, as Julie and I called it. No more running to the village school. Poor Mark had to get the bus a half an hour before we left home. The village bus would drive all the older children to the 20 minute journey to the big school. It was then that things changed and began to go horribly wrong. I hadn't realized quite how much Julie had missed her big brother, but as a consolation, her parents surprised her on her birthday with her very own puppy. So with Mark at big school and Julie too busy with her new puppy, our time together reduced. I confessed to missing them both very much 
and feeling quite lonely without them. But I did my best to amuse myself with a lonely walk, a boring shopping trip with my parents, a lonely row in the boat along the river, and probably watching far too much teal television. However, as time moved on, we settled into our new status quo, and it seemed all too soon that Julie and I joined Mark on that bus to attend big school. It was on those bus journeys that I discovered what a reputation Mark had got for being quite aggressive. I hadn't realized what a bad reputation he had earned himself among the locals. However, our relationship seemed to rekindle to a small degree. It wasn't uncommon for us to sit vigil over the chicken house. Mark loved his chickens, and it was the first time I had ever seen a boy cry. When he awoke one morning to discover the chicken house had been raided by foxes, or as he kept shouting at Julie, her bloody dog, he was adamant that Julie's dog had killed his chickens. My heart bled for him as nobody in his family seemed to care. This feud between the two of them never really lessened with Julie insisting it was the foxes that killed his bloody chickens. Mark, now considered old enough, was entrusted with one of the farm guns, and there he would sit listening out for the foxes, as Mark sat holding that gun, his finger hovering over the trigger. To be honest, I now wonder why I bothered joining them. The atmosphere between the both of them was frosty, to say the least, and Mark still adamant that it was her bloody dog Julie, getting so upset that her dog was getting the blame, would then stomp off leaving me with Mark, who continued to berate the bloody dog. I too would be upset, not only with Mark's distress, but the fact that Julie was so obsessed with her dog that she would not join in anymore with our nighttime adventures of Chicken Watch. I can recall vividly that horrendous morning. I was awoken to the noise of a howl, a cry. I could not tell which, then a scream. I looked out of my bedroom window, which had a view over the farmhouse, and there I saw Mrs. C hugging what looked like a sobbing Julie, behind Mr. C carrying Julie's dead dog in his arms. I ran outside in my dressing gown to see what was happening, but my mother called me in and asked me to leave the family alone. I managed to drag the story out of my mother. Julie had woken to discover her dog had been killed. He had been shot, and by the body was a pellet that Mr. C recognized had come from the gun that Mark had been entrusted with. I am not privy to what happened to Mark after this tragedy, but his absence from the farm and adult whispered conversations that would stop immediately when I walked into the room suggested that he needed help and he had gone to a special place to get that help, not just for the killing of his sister's dog, but for his aggressive attitude displayed at school. Julie was distraught. I thought I might see more of her after the death of her dog, but she seemed quite elusive with me. Her new friends at school, who were now who she seemed to enjoy spending most of her time with, and their mutual love of the band The Rolling Stones made me feel quite the outsider. I can remember Julie and her new friends laughing at me on the bus one day because my clothes were old fashioned. I wasn't wearing the platform shoes they had, and I couldn't afford to go to the concert where some famous band was performing. I even recall a few times where Julie and her new friends taunted me and were ever so cruel. I can hear them singing, la, 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 Valerie, Valerie, Val, Val, Valerie. Julie knew how I despised being called anything other than Valentina. She knew how to push my buttons, I must say. So, suffice to say, Julie and I went our separate ways. The next thing I heard was Mark was in big trouble again, only this time not for being the local bully boy and killing his sister's dog, but for killing his sister. Her body was found in the stables, Mark's gun found buried in the straw. Police had dusted for fingerprints, and sure enough, it was confirmed. His gun, his fingerprints on it. I never understood why he hadn't worn gloves. According to my parents, who I consider the front of all knowledge regarding events on the farm, they said he harbored great hatred for his sister, for not only allowing her dog to kill his chickens, but the fact he never accepted responsibility for killing her dog, and he blamed her for his time away to get the special help that he said he didn't need. The years passed by, and my parents had been killed in a car accident. Mark was not in prison anymore for murdering his sister, 
but now transferred to a hospital for the criminally insane. It seemed he had not handled prison life very well, constantly fighting and causing violent harm to other prisoners. He refused to accept any responsibility for his crime, and as such, and with a reduction in his mental health and sanity, it was deemed necessary to transfer him to a hospital, the one for the criminally insane, just half an hour drive from our village. Mr. and Mrs. C, now retired, still lived in their farmhouse and were delighted that the drive was only a half an hour away. The highlight of their week was Thursday, the day they were allowed to visit their son. By the good grace of Mr. and Mrs. C, I was allowed to live in the farmhand's cottage, the same cottage that I had grown up in. To help make ends meet, I had taken a part-time evening job at the local inn just up the lane. And now I bring you up to speed as I finish this account of how it is that I have ended up in a hospital apparently needing psychiatric help. I trotted off to work last night with no worries or concerns. The lane was glorious. All the hedgerows, fields, and trees were in the last of their full bloom. Twilight was descending and birds settled into their nests for the night. The inn was unusually quiet, so at the request of the few locals that were in, we turned on the television to watch some tedious sporting program. But the locals seemed to enjoy the show and the evening passed without incident. That was until I started to clear up and say goodbye to the handful of customers. As I lifted the remote to turn off the television, a news flash appeared on the local station. Police are advising the public to act with great caution as a psychiatric hospital has announced the escape of one of their patients. A slight shiver ran through me, but I told myself to get a grip. I turned off the television, I locked up the inn, and as in my routine, I posted the key back through the letterbox. A sense of forbidding flooded over me as I stepped out into the night, but I had a word with myself and I reminded myself that I only had a five minute walk and I would soon be safely back home. As I wrapped my summer cardigan tightly around my waist, I walked past the bus shelter and bulked as I thought I saw a shattery figure huddled in the corner sitting on the bench. The moonlight was playing cat and mouse with the clouds, so I convinced myself that shattery figure was nothing but a trick of the light and continued my walk back down the lane. But it was only a few moments later when I was convinced that I heard footsteps behind me. I spun around to see who was there, but I saw nothing. Nobody was there. I headed on my way. I do confess, however, that I thought my heart might beat out of my chest. And just when I thought I could not be more frightened, I completely lost the light of the moon as an untimely big black cloud plunged me into darkness. Fear is a very difficult sensation to impart, but it is true that my legs did feel like jelly. I felt nauseous. The five minute walk home seemed to be taking forever, but suddenly I saw the lights of the farmhouse ahead. I knew if I could make it to the farmhouse, I'd be okay. Mr. and Mrs. C had been very excited recently due to not only the fact that Mark was only half an hour away, but that his psychiatric team had considered him well enough to be considered for home release. Personally, I was very concerned for their safety, but there was no telling them or convincing them that their son was a dark and evil soul and that their lives could be in danger if he returned. Sometimes they got quite upset with me, but I felt they that they did need to be warned. As I approached the farmhouse gates, I felt a sense of calm. I heard no more startling noises. So instead of going to the farmhouse, where I had considered going to in order to grab a gun from the gun cabinet, I headed for my cottage. With relief, I felt my feet upon the shingled footpath. But with horror, as I got halfway up the path, there was a noise. And then I heard footsteps behind me. I was too scared to look behind me, so my hands plunged into my pocket to grab my front door key. My hands shook violently as I searched for the right key on my key ring. The footsteps were getting closer. My keys then dropped to the ground. I felt sick as I bent down to pick them up, but even more fear entered my heart. For as I looked at my front door, I realized it was open. 
Bile started to enter the back of my throat and fear engulfed me. I couldn't go back for the footsteps sounded like they were right there. I had no choice. I ran into my house and slammed the door shut. I leaned up against the door, listening, hoping the footsteps would go the other way, but they didn't. And with horror, I realized I had left my drop key ring exactly where it had fallen. My legs could hold me no longer as I slumped with my back against my front door, hoping and praying the footsteps I heard wouldn't find my keys. An involuntarily scream escaped my mouth as I heard my key on the other side of the door enter the lock. I managed to crawl forward, then drag myself upright and headed straight for my kitchen. I bolted the door just in time. My head started to spin. I didn't know what to do other than I knew I had to move fast. The kitchen knife suddenly caught my eye, all lined up on a magnetic strip above the work unit at the side of the back door. Ten steps forward got me to the back door. Why did I lock it so securely, I thought, my hands shaking so violently as yet again I had to get that key into the lock. I heard the kitchen door being kicked. Whoever's footsteps was, I could tell. They were strong. Purely that sound, I looked behind me and saw the door's movement with each kick. I didn't know I was crying, but I could feel tears streaking down my cheeks. I swore at myself, furious at my hands for shaking. But at last, the key went in and I turned it, relief as I heard the click of the lock. I grabbed the biggest knife off the magnetic strip, ready to run, only to realize with horror that I bolted the door at the top and the bottom. My hands felt like jelly as I unslid each bolt. Another bang from behind me interrupted my concentration as I opened the door to let myself out. I looked behind me to see a black arm come through the shattered kitchen door and unlock it. I didn't wait to see who was causing me this dread. My legs knew exactly where they were taking me. I didn't need to think. I was heading straight to the farmhouse. The gate that was between the hedgerow was unbolted, and I sprinted through the gate, half wondering if I should bolt it behind me, wondering if it would slow down my progress, but decided it would take too long and be counterproductive. The light in the kitchen window of the farmhouse was shining brightly. I ran straight through the kitchen door. It was ajar. I didn't stop. I pushed the door open, still running, and then I saw them. Mr. and Mrs. C. Mr. C dead on the floor, lying in a pool of blood, and Mrs. C slumped on a dining room chair with her head laying on the table. The pool of blood under her chair had spread and merged into the blood of her husband's. As I entered this bloody mess, my feet skidded on the red pool of blood. I knew those footsteps that had been pursuing me would now catch me. As I fell on my knees, I could easily hear his breath behind me. I put my hands in the red pool of blood and spun myself around, ending up sitting in this bloodbath. I looked up, and for the first time, I recognized the face staring back at me. My heart skipped a beat. He was easy to recognize, even if Mr. and Mrs. C hadn't gotten photos of their son plastered over the walls of their house. I'd still have recognized him. He hadn't changed much. Here I was sitting in a pool of blood, my knees up and using my feet to push me back and away from Mark. It's strange how the brain works. For my brain, at the height of anxiety, had a thought that somehow managed to admire what an attractive man Mark had turned into. For each slide backwards that I made, Mark took one step forward. He was calm. I was petrified. I struggled to propel myself backwards. He casually stood, taking his time to approach me. Eventually, I could move no more, my movement impeded by the kitchen cabinet. He took a step towards me, then another. I checked my hand still holding the kitchen knife. Mark squatted down in front of me. He stared at me and stared some more. I felt sure he must be able to hear my heartbeat. He leaped towards me and through gritted teeth snarled at me. I grappled for the knife, but with the knife now covered in blood and my hand smeared with a sticky red mess, I realized I had lost my grip of the handle. Why, he growled at me. He leant in closer. Why did you kill my sister's dog? As I spoke, I sobbed my reply. 
because that dog killed your chickens, Mark. You spent night upon night telling me how her bloody dog had killed your beloved chickens. Mark leant back before plunging forward again. Then you killed my sister. I stopped crying. She bullied me, Mark, her and her friends. They hated me. They taunted me just because I wasn't attractive enough or could afford the clothes and shoes they could and just because I didn't like the Rolling Stones. Then he shouted, Now my parents, you've killed my parents. I gripped the knife and in one easy flowing movement, I plunged it straight through his heart. As he slumped forward, I dodged sideways and pulled myself up. I had to, I told him. You were being released soon and you'd want my cottage. I don't know if he heard me or not. I didn't care. I phoned for the emergency services. I explained to the police how I had acted in self-defense. They use forensic science nowadays, but I'm hoping I will get away with it again. But I must say, this is a very nice hospital. Most of the staff here have been ever so kind. Ironically, as I write this, one nurse has just entered my room. She turned to me and explained that it shouldn't be much longer for my session with the psychiatrist to begin. Sit tight, Belle, she said. Ooh, I sternly looked at her and said, please do not call me Belle. She replied in a condescending tone and said, why is that? I just smiled and turned my head away. Thought to myself, oh, you'll find out soon enough. Well, did you decide yet? Ha, 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 ha.